So I said I was going to do a series or a playlist on the modifications I made to this guitar, which is a Glary GTL Semi Hollow. Uh, today's video is going to be the first one in that series, and we're going to be talking about installing the Bigsby. So really, it's pretty simple. You just mount it on there, you put the screws on, and you're done. So thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next one. Actually, it's a little more involved. I don't want you to be overwhelmed. Don't worry, we're gonna talk it through step by step. I'm gonna tell you what I did, and hopefully you can get something out of it and apply it to your situation. Speaking of which, I totally understand that you probably don't wanna copy my exact guitar. I mean, you might not like the color of it, you might not like the style of the body, but the good thing is that the Bigsby B5 is applicable to basically any flat top, solid body electric guitar. We're talking about SGs, Telecasters of course, and even Les Paul Juniors. Now if you're looking for more information about different styles of Bigsby's, I have a video that you can watch by clicking on the eye in the upper part of the screen. If you go to about the 1 minute and 40 second mark, I walk you through the different types like the B7, B3, etc. But as I said, we're going to be talking specifically about the B5. Now, this is the first time I've installed one of these on a guitar, but it turned out great, and I'm gonna walk you through it. First of all, where did I get it? So, I just looked up the prices of these online, and if you wanna buy one brand new, you're looking at a minimum of 150 bucks. I actually bought mine used uh, for $126 out the door from Manchester Music in New Hampshire. It was kind of random. I looked all over the place online on Reverb, your typical places like that, eBay, whatever, and I really couldn't find a deal on one of them, and I happened to come across this one and I scooped it up. But like I said, if you do your due diligence, you can find one for a pretty good price. Even if it's used, it's probably in pretty good shape. So yeah, how the heck do you put one of these on anyway? Well, you've heard the saying, measure twice, cut once. That is definitely the case here, but instead of cutting, you're going to be drilling holes in your guitar. And again, I don't say that to be scary, but I do want to instill a healthy fear in you of just being careful and being aware and going back to that measure twice, cut once kind of thing. Now, if you don't want to put holes in your guitar, let's say you have a $2,000 Gibson SG and you don't want to permanently change its original format, there are alternatives. A company called Vibramate makes adapter plates specifically for Bigsby's. I actually have one on my Gibson Les Paul, which has a Bigsby B7 on it, but if I'm being honest, I don't really like the look of the Vibramate for the B5. It attaches to the strap button on the end of the guitar, but it leaves an unsightly strip of metal right here underneath the Bigsby itself. So me personally, I don't really like the look of that, but this guitar is cheap enough or inexpensive enough for me not to care, but your situation may be different. Oh, and I do want to mention that you can't just use a regular old Telecaster Ashtray Bridge with a Bigsby B5 without doing some modifications or buying a new one. You can use the original saddles if you so choose, but you might want to change those out and use different ones as well. I did make some modifications and change some things out on mine, but that is going to be in the next video. So all that said, let's take a closer look at the details. The first thing I did was take some blue painter's tape and place it along the sides of the ashtray bridge. I also put a strip of tape along the bottom of the bridge to give me an idea of the center line of the ashtray and the neck, the body of the guitar, etc. It turns out that the ashtray bridge is about three inches across, which puts it at an inch and a half from either side. I put a pencil mark there first, but it didn't really show up, so then I used a Sharpie. Now, all of this tape probably isn't exactly necessary, but I just did it as an extra assurance of the alignment of the Bigsby. Once I had my tape in place, I messed around and did some dry runs with where exactly to place the Bigsby. Now, this is probably a good time to talk about the distance of the Bigsby from the bridge or the back of the guitar. So I've heard a lot of things and I've done quite a bit of research on where exactly is the best place to put the Bigsby in relation to the bridge and the end of the guitar. I've heard recommendations like an eighth of an inch from the rear of the body. I've heard things like as close to the end of the guitar as possible. That actually came from some old official Bigsby instructions. I've heard things like two and a half inches from the bridge to the front bar of the Bigsby on an SG, which on an SG you've got a lot more real estate to work with in that area. I've heard things like an inch and a half from the bridge to the front bar on a telly, for example. Now, just for reference, when all was said and done with my particular installation on this guitar, it ended up being about one inch from the back of the bridge to the front bar of the Bigsby. In all actuality, when it comes down to it, it's really all about the break angle of the strings off the back of the saddles. The closer you move the Bigsby to the bridge, the more steep the break angle. The further away you move it, the more shallow. 
As with anything, either extreme is not good. It needs to be somewhere in the sweet spot in the middle. Most people say a break angle of about 8 degrees uh, or anywhere between say 7 to 10 is pretty good. With 5 probably being the absolute minimum and 12 being the max. But we'll get to all that in my example a little bit later. So the next thing I did was remove the strings and the reason I did that is because I wanted to use this red string that usually comes with Bigsby's to line it up. Uh, the used Bigsby that I purchased did not actually come with one, but I had one that was left over from a previous installation, and so I used that one. The idea here is to place the red string where your high and low E strings or your outer strings normally would be, such that as long as the red string is pretty much equidistant from either side of the fretboard, you should be good. Now, if you buy your Bigsby new, the instructions on how to do this are going to come in the box, but you can always go online and look it up there as well. It's not really too difficult to do, but I would say take your time. So one piece of advice that I would give is you take the red string and put it through the holes of the high and the low E string tuners, wrap it around, tie the string to itself, and that way you can tighten the tuners and get the proper tension on the strings to put the Bigsby in the place where you want it. So once you're happy with the placement, and I want to reiterate, just take your time, make sure it's in the right place. But after you're satisfied, you want to tape down your Bigsby so that it doesn't move in this next step when you mark your holes. Now you can do this a number of different ways. You can use a nail or a screw or a drill bit. Basically, you just need to make an impression in the wood so you know where to drill your holes. In my particular case, I used a drill bit and at first I just kind of wiggled it around and pressed down to make the impression. But I ended up using the end of a screwdriver to kind of whack it. Just Tap it in, give it a little tappy, tap, tap, tap a room. And make really sure that the impression was made so that it was obvious when I took the Bigsby off that the marks were where I wanted them. You don't want to be doing this over and over again, making marks that aren't necessary. Once I was positive I had good guide marks, I took the Bigsby off in order to drill the holes. In my case, with the used Bigsby I purchased, I got two mix matched pairs of screws. They were pretty much the same diameter and thread, so I decided it didn't really matter, and I chose to put the longer screws on the back side of the Bigsby and the shorter screws on the front side. So I used a drill bit slightly smaller than the screw diameter, and I used tape as a depth stop on the bit to ensure that I didn't go too far into the body of the guitar. Then I removed all the tape and I used wiggity wiggity wax to help lubricate the screws. Cause inside out is wiggity 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 wax. After I got the Bigsby on, and thankfully it went well and it was straight, I put the guitar strings back on and I roughly checked the break angle of the strings over the back of the saddles with a homemade piece of paper. Now here's a little bit of insight. This was after I notched or scalloped the ashtray so that the strings could go over the ashtray without hitting it. So I didn't really have any good tools to measure the break angle with, so like I said, I used a homemade piece of paper. Essentially, I just used the Pythagorean theorem and marked the degrees on the piece of paper, and it gave me at least a rough idea. But when I used this piece of paper, even though it looked pretty close to 8 degrees, I still felt it was a little too shallow. And so I decided I needed to shim the neck. There are different options for shim material. Some people use something like a business card. Fortunately, I had an old Stumac one left over from a different project. These, to me anyway, seem the best. They're really well manufactured. You can be assured that each one you get is going to be made to tight tolerances and specifications. And most importantly, they cover the entire neck pocket. They're kind of pricey if you buy them directly from Stumac and you have to pay shipping on top of everything else. But oftentimes, you can find them for cheaper on Reverb.com. And they make them in varying degrees, but typically 0.5 degrees is the middle road and works pretty well. 
Before I installed the shim, I decided that the neck pocket needed to be cleaned up quite a bit. So I leveled it out using sandpaper and a small block of wood. By doing this, you ensure that the neck pocket stays nice and level. Then I vacuumed and cleaned up any remaining dust and debris, then placed the shim in the neck pocket, making sure that the thicker side was toward the end of the neck, so that the neck tilted backwards. If you use a Stumac shim, the hole should line up to ensure that you have it placed properly. Hopefully you can see here from the side of the guitar the difference in the thickness of the shim. So after all that was done, I put strings back on the guitar and I rechecked the brake angle. And this time it seemed to be closer to a true eight degrees, or at least pretty close. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of the Bigsby installation, but I do have a random side note here. Somewhere along the way in my research, I came across this sort of miracle mod that is supposed to improve the Bigsby arm and make the action of it better. This guy said it was like the best thing that he had done to his Bigsby. And what it is, is you replace the spring that helps hold the arm itself on with a nylon spacer that measures 0.257 inches in the inner diameter a half inch outer diameter and a quarter inch length as you can see here from the packaging. And like I said, it's supposed to replace the little tiny spring that helps hold the Bigsby arm in place. Now the little nylon spacer fit perfectly, but spoiler alert, I did not like it at all. It either made the Bigsby arm too tight or too loose. I couldn't get it tightened down perfectly. It felt foreign and it just wasn't smooth at all to me. But if you're curious and you want to try it for some reason, it's probably less than a dollar, so it might be worth a shot. And that is the end, my friends. Help a brother out by subscribing, leaving a like or a comment. We'll see you in the next one. You are brighter than the summer sun.